This is Rumble, and I am Michael Moore, and I have uh, with me here today uh, an old friend um, and one of the funniest people I know, um, might actually be the funniest person I know, <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real honor uh, to, to have him here, and um, you know him um, uh, through any of a number of ways. Uh, he is a stand-up comedian. Um, he's got a, uh, his latest, uh, stand-up show on Netflix right now is, uh, called, uh, Jeff Garland, our man in Chicago. You, uh, may know him, uh, cause he plays the dad on the Goldbergs, uh, the ABC, uh, weekly, um, I don't know if to call it the sitcom or not, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a funny show. Uh, it's got uh, George Siegel on it and, uh, adorable kids and a loving wife, <laughs> How could it go wrong? Mm -hmm. And um, his acting in movies, uh, he, Jeff has been in everything from uh, uh, Daddy Daycare to RoboCop 3 to one of the Austin Powers movies. He'll pop up in these things. And um, and, and I'm, I'm going to ask him about uh, um, – because I, 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 was, I was told that he was in the, the last of the Star Wars uh, movies. So we'll find out about that. And also – uh, he's a filmmaker. He's a director. He's a writer. Um, um, uh, and he, uh, his, his latest film, which is also on Netflix, is called Handsome, uh, a detective uh, series uh, uh, of films. I guess that we'll, we'll see if there will be more of those. Um, but I think uh, to most of us, uh, we know him as Larry David's agent on one of the great uh, TV shows of all time, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Um, he plays agent, the, uh, Hollywood agent, uh, Jeff Green, uh, to Larry David, his real name in real life. Um, and his, uh, real role as, uh, also one of the, uh, the key executive producers that have, uh, has been with the show for, from its very, very start. Um, and, um, it's it's brought a lot of joy to all of us uh, over the years, and I'm I'm grateful that he is doing my podcast today. Please welcome Mr. Jeff Garland. Jeff, are you there? Yes, that's the longest intro. <laughs> wait, that I've ever allowed because you're my friend. I didn't cut you off, but generally, you know, when I'm introduced as at something, it goes on that long, and it's unbearable. Uh, it's a, yeah, yeah, I know. And one well, that, and one correction, I play Larry David's manager, not his oh, agent. manager. Not his That's agent. right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I don't think in the friend. show he doesn't have an agent, does he? No, I don't think so. And I'm his yeah. uh, best friend. I'm also Richard's agent. I forgot who else. John Legend. Like over the years, we've had who I am. Who I have. I don't remember. Yeah. You're the manager for. Yeah. Each manager. Of yeah. Yeah. Manager. Yes, not agent. Not the agent. I've confused so, myself now. Yeah. Not, I'm so sorry about that. All right. right. And yes, you play you play his best friend. But but the two of you um, were in cahoots on this idea, I think, from uh, from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. This started, I, I, and, I approached him. I, I had directed uh, Dennis Leary and John Stewart's. I co-directed. um Unleavened, John Stewart's, and Dennis Leary's uh, Lock and Load. And I mm. thought, oh, you know, uh, it'd be funny to make a special about the making of a special. And I approached Larry, who's a genius, and he said yes. And he's the one who insisted I play his manager. I wanted to just direct it. I say just, that's an undertaking. But no, he said uh and it's TV, so th there's more creative input in being uh, the uh, executive producer. So I uh, became executive producer and um, uh, played as manager. Um, yeah, but I was there from the uh, first idea of doing it. Little did I know, you know, that when we were filming, it was supposed to be an hour special. And when we were filming an hour special, first day of filming, about two hours in, he started saying to me how fun it was. And he said, wouldn't this be great to do as a, um, wouldn't it be great to do as a TV series? And I said, yeah. And inside, I remember thinking, yeah, right, that'll happen. I'm going to be starring mm -hmm. in a TV series with Larry David. 
right? <laughs> because he, I mean, he as the uh, essentially, uh, I think I can say this, the creative force um, behind the Seinfeld show, and that, and and he and Jerry, but but it it I think, um, I mean, uh, Larry David wrote many, if if not maybe most of the early episodes of Seinfeld, right? Um, so here in this case. In the pilot for Kirby Enthusiasm, which was it, it was like a special. It wasn't. It was maybe an hour, hour and a half long. That no, was an remember. hour special. Yes, an hour special. But it was basically about what you just described: you and Larry going to HBO to convince them to do this special. So the special, the special was about trying to put on the special on HBO. Right. And um, so, how long after you finished shooting that? Um, did you and Larry decide, you know, uh, this isn't such a crazy idea to do this as a weekly uh, series. Why don't we go back and talk to HBO about this? How, how, what, what is the origin story of how that happened? Well, the origin story is it was, we didn't think anybody would watch it as a special. And then people watched it. HBO wanted to meet and they asked if they could do it as a series. It wasn't like we, um, we, he mentioned that a few more times, you know, and I didn't really take it seriously. Little did I know it would change my life. Mm, right. So so then you decided to do it as a series. Let's explain to people if it's possible that, you know, somebody hasn't seen this. It is possible, obviously. But, and by the way, uh, when you consider yeah. how many people there are, it's likely <laughs> out of a nation of a nation of 330 million, yeah. there might be one or yes, that's yeah. true. Uh, I, I don't, don't make any assumptions about any time. Of any I would imagine that a majority of people that dig you, uh, dig curb your enthusiasm. I would, I would guess right. that. Right. So, so I'm just making the assumption then that people listening to this are, <laughs> are just my fans and, uh, and they're, and they don't need me to explain to them what Curb Your Enthusiasm is, but I'm going to right, do, do it anyway. Do the best people. you can. Don't have me yes, do well, it. I'm not good at explaining that. No, I'll explain, but you, but fill in. So, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yes, sir. Larry David plays Larry David, the uh, co-creator of Seinfeld, but he plays this curmudgeon um, who just doesn't understand people and why they behave the way they do, and even in the smallest of ways. And oftentimes the things that will bother him will be the, the things that probably have bothered all of us, but we would be too afraid to say anything about it. And we just stuff it somewhere and not, and not think about these various crazy behaviors of people we know. They could be friends. They could be neighbors. They could be family members. You might be married to that person. Uh, it, it, but it doesn't matter because Larry David, uh, the character in Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, I think uh, safe to say completely lacks any kind of filter that would he give does pause. operate from the id from the total id yes, I, and which also is, on the other side of that yes there's the id factor but he's also trying to get through the day with a bit of dignity and right. all these things that frustrate him stop that from happening right. and people's reactions to his reactions which is what we all wish we could do um, that's why I love this past season. That's my favorite premise we've ever done. Because also Larry's character, there is something lovable about this curmudgeon because um, he is he is trying to help. He is trying to make his own contribution to things, even again, and sometimes in the smallest ways. There's an episode where um, uh, his wife in the, on the show, uh, played by uh, Cheryl Hines, his wife's name in the show is Cheryl, and there has been a death in the family. And so all of her uh, uh, relatives are coming in for the funeral. And um, Larry is Jewish, uh, but his, his wife is a um, from a Southern Baptist uh, family. So all the Southern Baptists have come to stay uh, at, at the house. Uh, they already have questions about why she's married to, to Larry, but, you know, they go along with it like most families do. And um, he wants to help. He wants to do something. They're all getting ready and they're getting the flowers and they're getting everything set up. Let me put me to work. Let me do something. And they say, well, you're a writer. Why don't you write the obituary to put in the L.A. Times? And good, perfect. I'll do that. Any, any, and with no 
I mean, with, he throws himself right into it, wants this to be a beautiful uh, obituary, um, goes to work on it, gets it done, um, you know, doesn't phone it in or mail it in. He goes down to the LA Times, he submits it, and very proud of himself. He's done a good deed. Uh, the next morning, he wakes up, he comes downstairs. The entire wing of her family um, is there giving him the evil, the total evil stink eye and angrier than get out. And he's like, what, 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 how could you do this? How could you do this to our family? What are you talking about? The, the obituary. Why would you do this? And, and he's like, why would I do? I, I, you asked me to write, I offered to write it. I wrote it. I went to the LA times. I, I placed it. I paid for the ad and, and they're look and Cheryl, you know, and Cheryl too is upset his wife. And it just, he just shoves the paper in his hands. And he looks at the obituary and, and, you know, it has the woman's name and, and then um, it began very beautifully, almost like poetry, beloved, you know, beloved aunt, so-and-so did this and this for family and for people in her community and all this, except the LA times uh, made a typo. Um, they, uh, not, nothing, not a typo on his end, just the LA, you know, the newspaper screws up. It's run by people and it doesn't say beloved aunt. They have mistakenly typeset it, not with an A at the beginning of that word, but with a C. And so the whole family is standing there with their their beloved aunt. Yep. Not being called a beloved aunt. Yep. I love that episode because it, it shows how, you know, he so doesn't want to have to put up with people. And yet, yet he always is, is trying to, the, 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 the the same thing with the their 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 beloved Delhi is sold, and it, it's bought by Palestinians, and they decide to run a chicken restaurant. They're all upset. All Larry and all his friends, they want their Delhi back and whatever, and uh, and then they go there and they eat the chicken, and it's like the best chicken they've ever had. And thus begins this uh, series, almost that that season long thing about Larry was not going to give up on the Palestinians because damn it, their chicken was just too good. The, this this is just I do, okay. That's the end of my description of the show, and I and there are so many other episodes. Uh, maybe we will talk about them, but 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 Jeff, um, there's nothing like this on TV. There had been nothing like it on TV. The that that. There are shows with antiheroes, but this, I don't know what to call Larry or Larry's character in this. Well, by the way, most of modern television in the comedy world outside of, let's say, South Park, all the shows that people love, Parks and Rec, The Office, The English Office, all of them were influenced by uh, one another and Curb. Curb started that whole style and it went on to different types of styles, but that was Curb Your Enthusiasm was the first of its kind. Right. Where you loved watching a completely unlovable character that, that somehow as a viewer, you're drawn. Well, that's, that's you're drawn the to this office individual. That's both American and English yeah. office. No, this you're was right. the, um, and then, but prior to that, cause I don't want to say, um, that Curb invented the wheel. Because, you know, prior to that, let's talk about unlikable. You had Buffalo Bill and you had uh, Faulty Towers with Basil Faulty. Also unlikable. Um, only Faulty Towers was a success. Buffalo Bill was not a success, even though it was well made. Um, and then uh, you had, and then the show that I give the most credit to um, to uh, creating Curb Your Enthusiasm, to Curb Your Enthusiasm existing was Larry Sanders. Because Larry Sanders right. showed me, right. uh, Larry Sanders showed me that comedy could be uh, done in a realistic way on TV, a really realistic way. My favorite all-time show is Mary Tyler Moore. And I cared and... You, you, you got involved, but there was a difference in Larry Sanders 
in terms of the edginess. Same with, if you go back drama-wise, the show that changed everything was Hill Street Blues. So you can go back Mm. to Hill Street Blues as really the thing that started everything, because Hill Street Mm. Blues obviously led to the Sopranos, you know, that journey. And so television's, television's changed by by uh, a bunch of different things that happening over a period of time. But Curb was the one that, for a tone, uh, set a certain tone. But it wouldn't be there without Larry Sanders. Well, that's, I, well, Gary Shandling was, uh, was also a genius. You know, Ga- and, Gary uh, and I did a conversation at Largo, and I told him that on stage. And the... I, I knew, I had thought that he had to have thought this. He had to have thought I opened the door for Curb. And when I said that, he just beamed and couldn't thank me enough. Mm. Wow. Yeah, he's. I think he's very much missed. Yeah. Um, but l- let me talk about this. You, these conversations at Largo, which is a, a, a club in L.A., yeah. um, where you you did these essentially you did these podcasts. Yes. This is this is before it became cool to be to have a podcast. It was pretty it was and, pretty early. It was very popular, but I was far too busy doing Curb and the Goldbergs that I just had to give it up. Well, it, it was I believe the first podcast I ever appeared on. And so um, I was also happy just to uh, have you come on today because uh, because th- th- now that I have one, thinking back to that that night and and the things I opened up with, and you had an audience. I don't have an audience, yeah. but there was a but but there was something I loved about the fact that it was just audio, that it was just sound, just sound, and just audio. Go with we, your imagination. Yeah. Picture our yes. faces. And, picture everything. Yes, and so you got me to tell some stories that required some serious imagination, including my, my infamous OJ yes. uh, crime, created, crime story. Created a lot of excitement. Yes. <laughs> it did. That thing went everywhere. And um, so, so I've thought a lot since then, since that night about doing something like that, because I've always. Well, conversation, always, I think is yeah. delightful. And when you have, hopefully we're remotely interesting. I don't know. But the, the, when two people have a conversation and they're raconteurs and they have that ability, it can be really delightful. I'm not going to say who, but I had a few people. It was like pulling teeth. And uh, mm-hmm. I remember saying to Conan early on in his uh, talk show life, you know, we've been friends for years, that actors in general are not going to be interesting so you really gotta dig deep and look like you're interested (laughs) (laughs) you do because any actor that's why they do the pre-interviews are for actors and sometimes writers People Explain that, to people that that when when you and I and others are on when you go, talk when you shows, go on a talk show, uh, generally a couple days before, uh, there's a person who will interview you and try and get stories out of you, and that way the host, when they're interviewing you, can sort of tag you for one of these stories that the segment producer, that's the person who does the first interview, said, this is a good story. I stopped. I'll do it uh, for maybe a minute and just calm them down because it's my feeling that I'm at my best when I have no idea what I'm going to be asked. And I have, it's just It's an area where I have great confidence. And when I was doing long pre-interviews, I felt like I had to work a hundred times as hard to not be stale. Whereas an actor, like even though I act, I'm a comedian and I'm an improviser. And an actor is okay doing multiple takes, if you will. They'll tell the story more than once. For me, it's all about the first time I tell it. Right. 
And it's never, I know this as a documentary filmmaker and I, and I'm, with my first film, when I didn't know what I was doing, I saw right away that if, if I felt like, oh, there was some sound or something happened, I want to do this over. Anytime you do it over, and these are with non-actors, obviously documentaries are with, you know, just real people. They then try to act. Yep. And try to say again what they just Recreated. said. Recreate it. Never come. Well, by the way, act. I can even put this with, you know, I'm a photographer. And I, when I take pictures of someone, I, uh, I have two strategies. One is generally the first picture is the one that's going to be the one. And then sometimes if they put too much as a, like they perform for your picture, which you don't want. I want casual you know, uh, pictures, um, that's the best look. I'll wait until they've done their little show and pretend like I'm not taking pictures anymore. And then I start taking pictures. But, Mm, and then the first one of that group will be the best one. So 90% of the time, the first picture, the first time someone talks, the best. And, and I, I don't have the guts probably like you have to just sit after a minute and say, hey, I think we got enough here. Um, that's the end of the pre-interview. Oh, um, I actually, they know in advance that I don't want to be doing the pre-interview. Oh, that's good. My, yeah, my yeah. publicist lets them know Jeff would rather not. And if they say, please, they say, okay, you got a minute, two minutes tops with him. And then all I'm doing in the interview is telling these producers to relax. And they'll say, right. you know, Conan, you know, Jimmy, you know, whatever. And I'm like, I do. Therefore, they'll be fine. And it's never not worked. And that's only right. from a confidence level, not from an ego level. Because I go out wanting to be funny and interesting. I don't go out thinking, ah, oh, I'm the king. You know what I mean, man? You know, er- Yes, early Johnny Carson. I remember as a kid, uh, if I could sneak sneak up to stay up, you know, late. Uh, I was fascinated by the conversations back then. Carson, uh, and, and this is when you know I was a kid. Maybe you weren't even born yet. But, but no, this is when the Tonight um, Show was ninety minutes from New York City. Yes, at, from New York City till one in the morning. And he had rack on tours on. He had people who told stories. Yes, interesting people. And if you were interesting, you were on earlier. See, now it's it's how famous are you? How popular are you? That's who goes or, on early. Or you're you're on because you've got a movie opening. Well, by the way, on because you're dropping a record. By the way, that's how it always is. That's not. So let's say I've got a movie opening, but a bigger name has a movie opening. But the bigger name's an actor. Not that interesting. Boom. They'll put him up first. And I have actually said, look, I don't care if I go, if you're the first guest, for example, on a show, I'm thrilled going second, happy as can be. But I have followed people enough times to where they're just dead weight and they're full of ego. And by the time they get to me, most of America has turned off their their show, the TV set. So for me, I don't mind. I got no ego about going second. But I got to follow somebody that people want to hear that can tell a story, that can talk. And that's not most of the popular people. Right. You know, this whole thing about who's first and who's second on the on the show. Uh, I had reached a point after a number of my films where I was starting to be asked to be the first guest on the late night uh, talk shows. And um, so I, I went down to NBC to do Conan one night and I, I was to be the first guest. And um, so I'm just sitting there in the green room, getting ready and waiting uh, for them to start. And um, uh, Conan had to come in and and his producer, and they looked like they were so nervous to to talk to Jeff Ross, it was him and Jeff Ross. Yeah, Jeff Ross, I know. And so they said, look, we got a problem. Uh, Guest number two um, has, um, uh, gone to Lauren, Lauren Michaels, who was also the producer of Conan's uh, late night show back then, NBC. And also obviously everybody knows, uh, the founder of Saturday Night Live, um, has gone to Lauren and, um, is very upset that I'm, I'm not going to say the gender. So I'll just use the, they, um, that they weren't going to be the first guest. And, essentially was refusing to to go on unless I, it was flipped and I would be guest number two. And, you know, did I have a, would that be okay? Cause they really needed to, 
And and I think maybe this person might have been a, a cast member of Saturday Night Live. I'm, I can't, can't well, I, maybe I remember, but um, I just want to keep this as anonymous as possible because um, I actually love this individual. Um, you do? And yes, yes, I love I love this individual's work, and um, and and have come to love this person as a human being, even though this person uh, was trying to get me removed. As the first guest, the first guest gets two segments. Second guest gets one segment. Mm-hmm. And I, I said, to, I said to Conan, uh, "No, no problem. I, I just said what you just said. I don't care what what the order is. I, there's no, there's you know, it's it's it really doesn't matter. And what I was going to say in two segments, I know how to say that in one segment. So it, it's it's all good. But it was really, and it was it was a funny thing because they were so relieved and couldn't believe that I just really I couldn't care less about it. But after that. Jeff uh, Ross uh, asked that, uh, would I be willing to be on a list of people that when I'm in New York, uh, because I lived, you know, somewhat near NBC, that if they ever had a, a you know, they have a, every now and then somebody cancels, can't gets sick, doesn't show up. Um, could they give, could, would I be one of their emergency fill-ins to be a guest? They have, you know, they have a list of maybe half a dozen New Yorkers and people. And I said, absolutely. And so I did that a couple of times for them after that, when they, when there was a no show and they're like, can you get here in 20 minutes? Um, but, but no, I, I felt no animosity toward this individual. I felt bad for them um, because they, you know, sometimes when people are starting out and fame hits them uh, quickly, uh, you, you know this, Jeff. You know what I'm trying to say. Well, if I could be, if I could be really clear, and I yeah. understand this because we all go through it, and we all do. And there were great lessons for me to learn about this. Although I like to think that I'm really kind in general, so therefore, uh, I, it didn't. I didn't really use it for evil. But the one thing that gets in the way of everyone that you've got to get, you got to figure out how to deal with is ego. And I, I know I aspire like I, I I like to think that I'm humble because I'm very appreciative and I think I'm blessed with every aspect, no matter what I to be on your show with you right now. I am blessed and feel so lucky. All right. Um, but on the flip side, as I mentioned before about me doing talk shows, I mentioned the word confident. I'm confidence. I'm confident and I'm confident in everything that I do. But I have learned. And by the way, took a long time. I've been in show business a long time. It took a long time to learn to get that sort of thing of like where I used to think I was ignorant enough to think I could eliminate ego. You cannot eliminate ego, but you can learn to recognize it and say, hey, not necessary. We're good. Don't I don't need mm-hmm. you right now. I'm talking about talking to ego. So yeah. that person in their position was feeling a sense of entitlement and ego. And you hope they learn from it. Whenever I see someone do that and they're on the sort of newer side, I do let it go. But when I see people who should know better, it only makes me sad. It may both make me sad, but it makes me terribly sad. When it's someone yeah. that I expect that's how more I felt. Of. I felt kind of oh, I wish this person didn't feel like somehow they weren't being validated because they weren't the first guest. Yeah, but that you know, but that happens, and, I, and hopefully they've learned from it. I mean, you could tell me if they have. Well, uh, well, uh, yes. But the answer to that is so yes. There you go. This person ha- has learned from it, and I've learned from it. I got. I mean, I'm human too. So after a few more films, and after you know, setting a box office record with Fahrenheit 9/11, now. I was definitely the first guest. And, uh, and in fact, Jay Leno had, had me on that year of Fahrenheit four times, four appearances in one year, unheard of, you know, this, yeah. I mean, you, you just, that's a rare thing. And um, so I, so I was on Letterman uh, that year. And um, so they told me, um, you know, I have two segments of the first guest I'm standing in the wings there, the Ed Sullivan Theater, getting ready to go on. They call me out. I go out, have a great first segment. In fact, I was thinking, wow, this is going kind of long, no commercials. So this is really cool. And and at the end of maybe a good 10, maybe even 12 minutes, uh, Dave says, 
Well, Michael Moore, thank you so much for coming on. His new film is for him. I'm like, I'm the look at my eyes. I'm looking at him. I'm like, wait a minute. Where's my second segment? No, they put them together. They put them. Yeah, see, I didn't know that. Yeah. So I walked off the stage. I walked off the stage. I was there with a couple of friends and I was really upset. You thought that you, th- like, you th- thought that he didn't want you anymore. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. Did I say something wrong? Right. Did I, what, where, where, where's, where's my other segment? Yeah. Like, you know, I've got the, no, the you know, best thing my, in the world open number one in the box. And by office. the way, if you ever have a choice, one long segment is way better than two segments. Oh, it's so much better. So, so that's what the producer is trying to explain to me backstage, you know, and I still, I wouldn't have it. I was like, I don't get it. I was told two segments and I'm like, I'm like, I'm not myself. Right. Of I, course. And, so, so, so one of my friends is there with me and she says, um, you know, um, you do know you were just on David Letterman <laughs> yeah. for, for 12 minutes. And, and you do know that you, when you were standing there, just before you went out, you were standing where the Beatles stood before they ran out for the first time in, on the Ed Sullivan show, you were standing on their on that sacred spot <laughs> and and to be coming from Flint, Michigan, to be growing up there, to ever think that I would ever have this opportunity to speak to millions of Americans on a late night show, but also to do it from where the Beatles began in the United, you know, when they began their uni- United yes, States sir. thing. And, and boy, when she said that, it really hit me. Um, Cause I have, I do have large storage, facilities of humility <laughs> you do i know that <laughs> and i know i do i really way, try the only way to and live I, life is big picture big picture yeah micromanaging as people listening know ruins businesses ruins corporations mm. ruins mm. people's souls so mm. you gotta think big picture all the time whenever i have an assistant uh always telling them big picture don't i mean sur- surely get the details right but always big picture. Don't. Has this happened to you though? Have, have you had a moment somewhere in your career where all, all, and because you are a person of conscience and because you, because you do, you're, you're talk, talk about humble and, and humility. I've seen you mentor so many people over the years. I mean, uh, I mean, we could literally could draw one of those family tree charts yeah. of of the people that uh, uh, by the got way, help that's, from Jeff Garland. But that's a thing that I love. I love doing that. I love mentoring, helping people. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I love but it. Have you ever had one of those moments where where the light bulb went off in your head where you thought, oh, wait a minute. I'm, um, what am I doing? What am I saying? Oh, oh, am I, why am oh, I how's fe- this? feeling this? How's this? God, yes. God, yes. And, and, <laughs> and, and know that it happened well, I got to tell you, uh, not too long ago, I was uh, asked to do a show at the Improv. I was told a certain time and I get there and the the guy who, who like is producing the show is kind of he's like, do you want to go like he's he's not he's not sticking to his word with me. And he's he's using other comedians like oh, you want to go now because everyone wants to go up and get out. That's like a lot of shows that you do. Well, I do too. And just, and then he pretended to me like he didn't do, like I'm being very obtuse. Point being is, yes, it's happened even recently where I'm like, no, I don't need this crap. But that's more (laughs) self-respect. On the other level, when I was younger, most definitely I got caught up in the small, small shit. Small shit. And I still right. do it now, but I catch myself so much quicker. So much quicker. Because you realize life's too short. I don't know. Oh, God. Yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. Although that like phrase doesn't pop in my head, but it's just a big bowl of what's what am I doing? Except stressing myself. I do everything. I. By the way, I'm not afraid of conflict. I'm not afraid of difficult things, but I do everything in my power to ease my stress. I meditate. I I like to think of myself like, uh, um, uh, uh, what's the Jeff Bridges movie? One of my favorite all time movies. My brain's dead right now. Uh, The 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 one where where he plays the dude. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, um, uh, uh, Raising Arizona. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) 
<laughs> there is a similar, the big Le, it's the big Lebowski. There is a the similar tone in that same filmmaker, <laughs> but but Big Lebowski. So I like to think of myself like to don't know if it's always true. As a, even though I get people hear me yell or whatever, still who I am, mellow dude, man. I'm a mellow dude, and I dig that, and that's what I you are mellow, and I yeah. aspire to be that. But I also wait, wait, I, wait, I'll I give you an watched, example. Yeah. Okay. About ego and everything. So today I had to go to the bank to uh, deposit some checks and I'm sitting there waiting and getting some cash back, what have you. And it's a small branch of my bank. The three people that are at desks are all wearing masks. I'm wearing a mask. Guy pulls up in his truck, starts walking towards. And I said, "Uh uh-oh, no mask. He comes in and I say to him, not with any aggression. I go, do you have a mask? He goes, no, man. Uh, he goes, does it bother you? I go, it does. And then he says, well, it's America. And we're, we're free here in America. And the manager ultimately asked him to wait outside because of his lack of a mask. And he made, he made a big deal out of it. But point being is, he's completely right. Uh, um yeah, you don't have to wear a mask. It's called being considerate to other human beings. And you know how you get everybody to wear a mask? You tell them that it protects them as opposed to protecting other people, which is what the mask does. It protects other people, not you as much, very minimally you. And then you'd have more people. But when he said, does it, does it, uh, you got a problem with that? I said, I do, but obviously there's nothing I can do about it. And then he said, that's right, because it's a free country. But I knew better. I, my ego, you know, knew better than to confront him more because clearly he's not thinking the, uh, in a logical, thoughtful, kind way. And I've also learned, I learned this from my father and I learned this from experience. You work your side of the street, I'll work mine. That's uh, a line from the movie Bullet with Steve McQueen, where he tells Chalmers, uh, his, his nemesis, if you will, and, and the police, you work, Chalmers, you work your side of the street, I'll work mine. And I kind of feel that way with this dude. I told you how I feel. Now it's, up, it's not up to me anymore. It's up to you. Uh yeah, you work your side of the street. But I had it today where I didn't let ego take control or bravado. I let it go. Mm. Yeah, but it's also, but the healthy part of ego, like you said, self-respect, that, that is a good thing. That I don't do know that that's ego. part of ego is the self-respect. Because if you're being treated poorly and you have self-respect, you know to make it stop. But also a lot of people... My big thing in the world is to be kind to yourself, which is something we've always heard. And nobody tells you how incredibly difficult it is. How Mm -hmm. It's so difficult not to call yourself an asshole. So Mm -hmm. you were just saying to me, oh, yeah, self-respect. Well, sometimes people, all right, I'll I'll go this way. Uh, People that are abused, and I'm talking about women, men, children, anyone. And then they look back on it and go, why didn't I do something? Well, you only know what you know in the situation, you know, that you're in. And if you don't know how to handle that, don't beat yourself up that you didn't stop it, you know. But as you grow and you see, no, I need to be an advocate. I know someone who has had the worst abuses. Oh, my God. And they... Um, are such a great self-advocate that I, I'm in awe of them, that they advocate for themselves after all this stuff has gone down in their life. And to me, I find that remarkable. But I don't think I, 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 I go against you and say, I don't think that's ego. I don't think that's ego. Ego is so thin. Ego is when you measure anything by ego, ooh, no good, man. No good. But if see, here's the thing. If you're confident and you're kind to yourself and you have a sense of yourself, then you have self-respect and you won't allow things to happen. So so what do you do? What do you do then when you're they've asked you to come down to the improv yep. and do and do a set and they tell you how it's going to go left. And, you, and you show up. 
You, yeah, you have to leave, though. Yeah, no, I left. I didn't even make a big deal, but I just told him, no. I see what you're doing. I got to go. Good luck to you. And the other comedians. Because they didn't keep their word. Yeah, they didn't keep no, their word. exactly. So I left. I didn't leave in a huff. And I did think to myself, boy, you make yourself available sometimes when you should just be at home resting, which is something I had to learn, which is true. I didn't say yes to every show. I stopped. Um but but when you're but, in a situation, I, you have to advocate for yourself. You have when I say have to, if you know better, some people don't know better yet and they don't even know how to be nice to themselves yet. But damn, if you should damn, you should work hard at that. Work hard. Yeah. yeah. I, I couldn't have done what you did though today at the bank. I, I couldn't, I, you know, um, you know this about me, but maybe people listening to this would think, of course I would say something. I, I would be advocating. And right. For the well, you have to, it's all our health. It's, it's, it's the four of us in there that he's hurting, not himself. Yes. But I'm saying, Jeff, I don't think I could have or would have done that. Um, what I did. I, I I, yeah. What you did. Well, you would have had to continue. Or leave. Oh, or no, no, no. Whatever. I agree. And by the way, I made sure that I was a good amount of, I'm sure you were. of yeah, away yeah, yeah. from him. And by the way, if he came towards me, not even in a physical way, I mean, like in a, in a light way, just standing near me, I would have walked out of the bank. No doubt about it. Yes. It could just be because of my own experience of a guy like that who lo- loves America. Yeah. Um, this, is in Southern, that, this is in Los Angeles though, man. He had no accent. Yeah. He, it's yeah. not even a stereotype. All right. Let me try the. I'll try the Los Angeles accent. Uh, I love America. Well, <laughs> can't do it. Can't do it. <laughs> it's all, this, I, it all goes through but, the filter. This is just, uh, it's a, it's an arrogance that a lot of Americans have. It's why we, even before our current president, we in some places, I mean, I would go and talk to the people. They didn't like the arrogance of Americans. They were put off by it. Everybody kind of loves the idea of America. And I'm talking about in Europe. Uh, uh, but the behavior, the entitledness of Americans yeah. is can be a little bit much. And this guy was completely entitled to live life the way he wants to. And I feel like right. go to a forest, man. But if I come walking through the forest, allow me to walk through if it's a public forest, you know. <laughs> right. But also, how about this? All those people in your home state of Michigan, other places who were out yeah. there saying, we want to get yeah. out. By the way, I there's a reason. I mean, not that anyone's noticed because thank God. But I've said no to every public service announcement. I'm a well-off, successful comedian I live in a nice house. I don't live in, if you saw my house, you'd go, that's a nice house. At no point would you say, that's a amazing house or that's ostentatious. It's a nice house and I have a nice backyard. Oh, I'm going to go tell people that they should stay in? No fucking way. I have no right whatsoever. However, Mm. um, we are doing, we've been doing this sort of staying at home festival to protect each other and get rid of the virus. So I think that all those people that are out in the streets yelling at medical workers, yelling, you know, it's it, this is and when they compare it as a Jew, when they compare it to Nazi Germany, that is about as insulting as it gets. <laughs> it's like, mm. hey, uh, <laughs> if not, if by the way, we'd never even refer to Nazi Germany if all they wanted us to do was stay home. <laughs> hey, Jews, <laughs> stay inside. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, it'd be a different <laughs> Nazi uh, Germany. But what I would like is for there to be papers that these people sign that say when they get the virus, they are not allowed in the American hospital system. Yes. I, I, I said like uh, many weeks ago that when they do the triage uh, out in the hallway where they don't have enough beds, they can't fit, they don't have enough yeah. ventilators. They, 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 so they're asking each of the patients these triage questions. I wanted one of the questions to be Have you at any time in the past three months referred to this pandemic as a hoax? Because if you have, I don't, 
all right, not that okay. I want you to die. Well, that's all. I don't want someone to die. Okay, but that's all good and fine. And I know what you're saying, but you're telling me those people would tell the truth? No fucking way. When they're at their no, mo- no, you give them the truth pill. You give them the truth pill. You're in the hospital. Give them the truth pill uh, first. You give them the truth pill first. That's funny. Yeah, it takes all right, a truth you pill. give them that shot or whatever it is. Yeah, they got the truth shot in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, but if they're <laughs> sick. I don't know if that'll work. But no, when they're at their most arrogant. And they're on top of their trucks with their shotguns and yeah. their flags. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Come over and go yeah. high. Uh, yes, you. Yeah. we've decided you can go and do what you want. But please sign this because if you get COVID, unless you're asymptomatic, you're fucked. Yeah. I love that idea. And, you know, I am from the state that where, if you've seen the, the news yes, this past yes, week yes, or two, yes. guns, taking guns into the state capitol. Big guns. Uh, I know. Big guns. I know to threaten the, the legislators. And it's, it's, it's maybe that's why I, when I said I wouldn't have done what you did today, because I know I, I would be at the bank and I would, I would not be playing Michael Moore. I would actually be Michael Moore. And that kind of guy that I've had to deal with, uh, as you well know, I've seen people um, throw hot coffee at you. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. And so twice, if he twice, had, it, twice. In a mall <laughs> and, and, and at the film festival, I saw it twice. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, the hot coffee stuff, well, that was best when they've come at me with a club, a knife. Uh, yeah. I've had probably half a dozen of these incidents. And then, of course, the one that I have, I don't talk about much, but the one where the guy built the fertilizer. The fertilizer bomb. Bomb. Yep, 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 yep. To yep. Build, blow up my house yep. in, in Michigan. And um, so that kind of guy, I can't tell that guy to put the mask on because he may be armed and uh, oh so you wouldn't like, have been able to say to him do you have a mask correct all i, I think said so, was, to be honest by the way i didn't even say it aggressively i said do you have a mask like more of a question and then he took it negatively but i i didn't let it grow if it grew it was going to grow in him not because i pushed his buttons yeah. because that's an ego well, thing to push the buttons or i want confrontation by the way I'm I've always been really good with people like that of actually engaging them and finding common ground. Mm -hmm. By the way, you're good at that, too. Mm -hmm. I've seen you do it. Yeah. And Sarah Silverman's really great at that, too. So it's not like it feels better to be that way. Of course. I I, I They want you to be they want you to confront them. No. That's their natural habitat in confrontation. I start with the attitude that we have more in common than not. And let's, why don't you we, do? Let, By the way, if aliens landed, you, I, I mean, you have way more in common with that guy today. And me too. Right. He's got a kid too. I heard from the people in the bank. They said he brings his baby in there sometimes, hmm. which that alone tells you like, what the hell is he thinking? Just going around like that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of sad. And also he grabbed the handle. Like I took some tissue out of my car and I also had like the stuff to uh, uh, sanitize my hands. I watched this dude, no mask. And he also is grabbing the door, uh, not worrying about where his hands are. Mm. It's just this is, by the way, I feel so good about what most people are doing. I feel Unlike you, because we've had this discussion already, I do feel hopeful. I do feel that a lotus flower will grow out of all of this. Don't know when. And for people who don't know, a lotus flower grows once a year and it grows up out of the shit and the muck. And I do think I am a believer. I'm I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. And I got to tell you, I feel like we're going to come out of this great. The economy will come back. Everything will come back. And there'll be people who will lead a better life because of it. They've grown. And then there's people who will not change at all. It's all the same. But the people that will grow are going to be that much better. The people who are artists are going to do art that's that much more inspired. And I don't care what kind of art you do. Um, I believe in all that, Jeff. I think that is what will happen. By the way, the baseball player who plays for the Cleveland Indians and sometimes is sitting in the outfield in Cleveland going, fuck, I don't want to be playing today. And you know that's true. He'll be saying, how lucky am I 
to be playing baseball. And guess what? My feeling is if he has the capacity to do that, it's not going away. Right. So it's not going to make other people worse. Do you know what makes other people worse? I already know. I know the reason why. So let's take racism. And there is racism in this country, but a hell of a lot less. That, and I look, I'm a white man saying this. There's less racism in terms of there are more people, uh, white people who don't care about black, don't care about gay, don't care about Asian, don't care about any of that, that they've grown up. My kids grew up that way. If you're gay or black, like, you know, it just doesn't matter. Like, that's okay. And what happens is as these groups of hate become smaller, they become louder and more aggressive. So it's there are I think there's just as much racism, but with less people, you know, they're just louder in the way they do it. Yeah, that's my that's my feeling. And I know there's plenty of people listening. You have so many astute people. And I don't talk about this stuff in my comedy because I have an inability to make it funny. But I do think that pe- there, people are more enlightened. People are more kind and thoughtful in general. That doesn't mean that there aren't assholes full of hate. And if they're going to change, uh, uh, um, you know, they're not, I don't think they're going to change. That's my opinion. That I think the new generations are what's changing and helping us evolve. I believe when we come out of this, out of the pandemic, I think things, I think people have had a lot of time to think, you know, do you really want to go back to the old, what we called normal, all of it? Some of it, yes, but all of it, weren't no. we tired of a lot of shit? You know, I think a lot of well, people, I think, I think it is going to be better. What, what well, you good. asked, what, that, what you asked me a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about this, you asked me a question. You said, how long do you think this is going to last? Um, like, when will we come out of our homes? Uh, hold on, hold on, hold yeah. on. I, I did not ask you that. Okay, what was the question? Uh, no, it wasn't a question. You told me. <laughs> We were discuss, discussing it. I was telling you that I went through a ton of therapy to learn, hold on, to learn to accept the unknown, not knowing. So I was just sort of, I, by the way, I may have said to you, well, what do you think? Because after I said that, maybe. Um, but I know that your feeling made me sad. <laughs> You couldn't wait to hang up the phone. You were so saddened by it. No, I wasn't. I love you. No, no, I was no. not waiting to no, hang sorry. up the phone. I felt but, I wrote you right away. I said, oh, my God, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Because people listening yeah. to the podcast know that I've said from the beginning what, what I had learned from people at the NIH and people that are, you know, got the muzzle on them from the Trump administration, that this is right. probably a two-year pandemic. Not two years of staying in the house, but there's going to be these waves, and we're going to go inside and stay, and then we're going to come out, and then we're going to go back inside. Okay. And, but let's but let's talk about this. Yeah, yeah. I actually, by the way, agree with that estimation. Um, but even with those people, it's an educated guess. This yes. is all conjecture. I don't watch TV news. I don't. I read every day. I read uh, um, probably a half a dozen newspapers, uh, all different types and uh, different cities, all that stuff. So that's how I get my news. I have not being in the house. Part of my sanity is I knew from the beginning you're not going to pay me to watch any TV news or any. I actually don't watch the talk show. I watch nothing except for uh, Netflix, Amazon and Hulu. When I watch something, it's on one of those three channels. Mm-hmm. I mean, three three uh, ways, and also Disney Plus. I want to give them the uh, the thing. I actually have enjoyed uh, Disney Plus for a lot of reasons, but um, I, I don't watch any of that because, man, every night different conjecture, different information. Don't want to even when the even when the the uh, New York Times says how long will this probably last? Like that's the headline. I'm not even going to read it Hmm. to me. I know it's not worth my time. Right. Because you can't do do anything about it. No. And I want facts. I want only facts. An editorial is delightful. But unfortunately, most of the ways we get news now is editorial. 
the people got to add their spin. And I saw when this started, it started with OJ, when the TV news people were telling people to not go outside of their house. And I'm watching going, yes, they're stupid. Yes, point them out to me. But you have no right to tell me as a news person to stay in. If the sheriff comes on in a press conference and says, we're asking people to stay in, okay, then I take it seriously. But I started seeing that. And believe it or not, after that, I noticed more and more of CNN and then obviously with Fox, people getting into this world of editorializing the information. And, you know, Trump can say fake news and and people love that theory of fake news. Yes, there are outlets that just make shit up, but they're not the outlets that, um, you know, uh, I don't think CNN is as much as they're, you know, they editorialize. There's a, a truth underneath it. You know, they're not telling you that the aliens landed and you know what I mean? Right. Um Uh, So, you know, I always look to the source when I get any news information. Um, It's possible from Fox to get the truth. You just sort of got to go, hmm, you know, let me let me look at that more. Because what was that medicine that that um, they that Trump hyped and they wanted to use? Oh, yeah. The hydrochloride something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I remember seeing an article with a doctor talking about it and all the great hope. And it was from Fox News. So my thought was, well, let me see who else talks about this and what's being said. And then nothing. And then it was all it doesn't work. You know, so uh, I just find that the editorial. See, that's the thing. It's not fake news. It's editorializing. If CNN didn't editorialize 90% of their news, I could watch it. I can't watch it because I don't want, I don't want Don Lemon's opinion. I don't. I don't want any of their opinions. I want the facts. Now, if Don Lemon hosts a show, hey, it's me, Don Lemon. This is my opinion. Great. But Don Lemon likes to tell us the news. And by the way, I like him plenty. I just don't want any sort of narrative added to what are the facts. Let me digest it. And that to me is what fake news is editorializing. Hi, I just got on a soapbox, a thing I never normally discuss. No, yeah, you don't. And you don't, uh, and you don't discuss politics in your comedy. Um, No, I think that it doesn't serve. My job is to ease people's pain. And if I can't make politics funny, it can't, it isn't going anywhere near my stand up or anything mm-hmm. I write, any movie I make, any TV show I make. I have no secret points to make. You know, one uh, of the reasons I, I wanted you to come on uh, today is for that, that very reason you just said that, um, uh, you know, obviously my podcasts are, you know, sometimes pretty heavy. <laughs> We're talking about all this stuff, but man, we need some relief. We oh, God, that. yes. But here's the thing. Here's why I don't do any of those living room shows. Here's why I don't do public service. I mean, Larry David's was very funny. But the reality is, the reality is I have worked a career doing high production value, thoughtful, hard work that I'm proud to have people watch. It is available on all these outlets to see. And hopefully people dig when they watch my special. I'm very proud of it. All good. But I don't want to use this time to do a bastardized version of what I do because I feel that America needs me. America Thank God, or wherever you live, uh, I'm happy that you have access to all the work I've done. Every movie I've made, every uh, every TV show, it's all out there. And please enjoy it if you so choose. Otherwise, deal with the day the best you can. But the last thing people need is me doing a show from my living room. I've done numerous podcasts. Happy and proud to do that. I did a couple of uh, photography Q&A things delightful. Um, but no, no, I, I, I think people do quite well without me, but we do need comedy. But the point being is it's out there. It's on all these things. Watch. 
when, including when? Groundhog Day. Groundhog <laughs> Day, I know, is on more than one outlet. Watch Groundhog Day, the work that went into that script, the acting, everything mm. about it, and the heart. Oh, that'll bring you joy. Come on, right, right there. Right, right. Don't need to see me in my living room. When when are you and the rest of Hollywood going back to work? I mean, when when do we? Well, by uh, the way, cause... that's a great question. Uh, I think here's look. It's quite obvious, and I don't think this is conjecture. I think this is common sense that nothing's going to be be happening until we have rampant and quick testing, where it's available and you get the results. Be great if it was like a pregnancy test. You get a result within a few minutes or right away. Until that happens, we can't go to step two. We cannot because we have to. And then there has to be tracking for people who are sick and who they come in contact with and came in contact with. I mean, I think we can we can get to a reasonable place without having the uh, the uh, shot for it. I said a reasonable place, you know, mm. without the shot. Once yeah. we have the shot, that'll make life pretty fucking delightful and right. we can go back. So it's really, we say two years, but maybe two years for the economy, but it's really a lot of it's going to depend on when we get a shot and when testing is readily. I mean, I got to give Los Angeles credit. Uh, they're giving a test to anyone who wants one. Delightful. But you yeah. know what test that is? A Q-tip going up your nose. Do you know what that tells you? Whether or not you have it. You know what it tells you? Pretty much uh, probably after the cycle's already run its course through you. You're either in the hospital or you're better. I mean, it takes 10 days, seven days. I mean, it's crazy. And it doesn't tell you whether or not you've already had it. So there's... Uh, uh, we have to get those tests. And I don't think that's conjecture. I think that's common sense. Uh, if I went to get a test though, um, say right now, yeah. Um, at the, uh, the, I know the local walk-in clinic yep. here down the block, yep. they have tests and get a test, but that all that test is going to say is, is that uh, I don't have, let's say I don't have it. Cause I don't, I don't think I have it, but let's say I don't have it. And the test confirms that you don't have it, yeah. but it, it doesn't mean that 10 minutes later, I can't walk around later in the day and say, well, hey, I tested. Well, by the way, that's the why getting it through the nose is really, I think, for people who are even slightly symptomatic, non-symptomatic people. I don't know what that does for you because right. I, do, I don't I don't understand. I know it's it's uh, it's asymptomatic, but I completely agree with you. That's why I'm saying we need quick, elaborate testing that tells you, is it in my body? Do I have the antibodies? When did I have it? All that stuff. So that's what's got to happen. This Q-tip, by the way, thank God for the Q-tip one, but it's what, because it's what we have, but still, you know. So can we talk some more about Curb Your Enthusiasm? Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, the um, First of all, it's now you've done what eleven seasons, right? Ten. You've done ten seasons. Ten so, seasons in twenty years. Wow! Uh, uh, please tell us that season eleven is going to happen. Uh, everybody wants. This I feel show. like it. I feel like it is, but I have no official word whatsoever. Okay, just saying that though is enough because if you yeah, feel, if you want to bring joy I feel, and relief, I feel good to people, about it. I feel good about it. When we will start shooting? Don't have a clue. See, the right. Goldbergs is on a set. So that that proves problematic in its own way. It's on a, not a set, but a soundstage. Whereas Curb is all on location. Certainly we can shoot things outside that would have a buffer, but it all makes for how do you do this? And I've also got a movie that I was in the middle of shooting and that's got to finish. Um, so it's like nobody mm. knows anything here. I mean, maybe people know more than me, but to me, I'm not going anywhere until I know whether or not somebody's had it or has it both. Right. So this doesn't sound like, and of course, and I, I, I too am in the same sort of predicament in terms of my next film and the other things I'm going to be doing. But I also, as you know, um, I, I restored a couple of movie theaters in Michigan 
that I run as a nonprofit. Uh, I thought that, I, did, I know you did too. What's yeah. the second one? Uh, we, we we took an old WPA built building from the Roosevelt era that's on the beach there and turned it into a, a smaller art house called uh, Bijou by the Bay. Oh, and, wow. Look at you. Yeah. I bet you it's do- it was doing really well. It was doing really, really well. Yeah. It's, and yeah. it's right there on Lake Michigan, right on the bay. And um, and so they, obviously we've been closed uh, uh, for a couple of months now. And um, so I was just talking to the, the, the people that, uh, you know, help us book the films. And, do you have any sense of when, and th- that person was saying that actually the problem here is, is that it's not so much like, when are they going to start making movies again? There's no, the system has shut down that sends the movies to movie theaters. There's no mechanism right now to right. even think about, uh, you know, getting but actual that, movies that, but that could change that's one thing that could change really fast because they must have things in the bank here right uh somewhere in the vault that they that were completed before this began or oh no 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 there's there's stuff but there you know here's another discussion and yes you know i i'm not going to make jokes of it uh but you know uh, movie theaters now they're, they're very angry at i forgot which studios it which which studio released that that movie, the grant, whatever movie it was, and it made so much money on the trolls, paper, the trolls, the trolls, movie? That, yeah. they, that they're now saying that they're going to do all their movies day and date uh, with, you know, theater, whatever. And then, of course, AMC and maybe some other people said, but here's the bottom line. And I point to the uh, 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 the Traverse City Theater and I point to the Bijou Art House that you said, yeah. if you make Going to movies, a delightful and joyous experience. People will go. Right. When you when you when you take all the movies of my youth, youth, and all of them, and turn them into multiplexes and even more multiplexes to where there's even sometimes twenty four screens. Well. You're not showing me any respect. You're showing respect to money and you're not basically, and this has been going on for years. So now uh, that we have systems in our homes that are even on a medium system, it's pretty gosh darn great. Forget even having a great system. A decent system is wonderful. Why would you want to go to a theater that's tiny? People are talking that there's a commercials, everyone loves trailers, but commercials and all of this. So it's like, <laughs> I think that there's always, just like a, a good bookstore, there's always gonna be space for a good independent bookstore and an independent movie theater. These multiplexes, why anyone would ever choose to uh, see a movie there over their home, there has to be a good reason. Like you're, you want a date? There's got to be a reason, because it's just you're not you're not making it fun for me to go out. Hmm. I think I think when we go back to seeing, boy, when we can finally get out of the house and go to, don't you want to go to a movie right now? I mean, I would just love to go to a theater and no, sit there. No, no, no. No, I'm saying That's if it. this was over. Well, this like, was over. Would I like to go see a movie in your movie theaters? You bet I would. But the local multiplex, even the Arc no, Light, which has a couple it. of screens that are nice, right. but nope, I have no desire to. So wow. people like, by the way, I talked to a comedian there and he was like, Aren't you anxious to get on stage? I'm like, I never in my career have gone more than two weeks in 37 years. So this is breaking all records. And I'm comfortable. I'm good. You've I'm never good. gone more than two weeks without being on the stage as a comedian. Yes, ever yeah. at any point in my wow. career. Wow. And now we're on, what, eight weeks, whatever it is. Um, no, I'm I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm not wanting to retire. And I do look forward to doing a show with an audience. But if you think I'm going to do a stand-up set and people in the audience are going to be wearing masks, not me. No, 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 that I will not do stand up. By the way, I'm not going to say kick people out if they have a mask and there's going to be people to the end of time now who will feel they need to wear a mask. But until we're covered on this in a way, I will not be doing a show. And I'm saying that 
Maybe I will. Maybe it'll be a benefit. But the point being is, in terms of my desire, I only have a desire to go back doing stand-up the way it was, not in the new world. I don't even mind if there's less people, you know what I mean? Right, Where there's space right. between people. That's not going to change. But for people to laugh, I got to see that. I got to feel that. There's a vibe that goes into that that will not work for me with people with masks. So I'm anticipating uh, maybe, I don't even know. I'm not anticipating anything. That's conjecture. I'm just comfortable. It'll happen when it happens. But I do know that for me, and by the way, this is the first time I've thought of this, but I have no desire to go into a world hmm. where I just, I'll make films. I'll continue to make films. I'll continue to make television, hoping that people laugh and enjoy it. But uh, in terms of stand up, that's an exchange. And by the way, when I do stand up, my style as an improviser and the way that I work so much is on how good the audience is. A great audience will, will make my show great. A bad audience will make my show mediocre. Always. Hmm. And so I'm, talking that about, I'm talking about where that's the audience. There are nights where the audience is great and I stink. That doesn't happen very often, and that truly rips me apart. But in general, the audience's energy, and by the way, they're not at fault. You know why? They have different DNA. They have different jobs. They have different romantic lives. They've eaten different foods. They're in different, every aspect of their life. And then these strangers get thrown in a room together. It's a chemical reaction with me when I go up. You throw masks into that reaction, that's not something I want to be part of. Would you watch an NBA game that had nobody in the arena? Would you watch that on Most TV? definitely. I would watch football, baseball, basketball, hockey. I don't care. I would watch. I haven't watched the Korean games yet, but I will just because I love watching baseball. I, by the way, if I'm in a park walking around and there's like a Little League game, I'll sit and watch it. And when you watch a Little League game, the least interesting thing is the fans so are the fans so i i'm all for when if the players can be safe in any of those sports watching them with no fans it's exciting it creates an energy with the fans you know i have season tickets to the bears i fly from la to chicago to watch the bears i also have clipper season tickets and i can tell you and the clippers uh, very very not very often uh you they're they're um they're more thoughtful. I'm not saying basketball fans, but maybe in L.A. in terms of there are some people who will call the quarterback a retarded asshole. And I'm mm -hmm. like, what? what about him is makes him mentally challenged and or an asshole because he couldn't throw a pass. <laughs> it was incomplete. So from that standpoint, I only hear that at Bear Games. I hear a lot of good people. There's a lot of great, but I hear things that I don't hear at any baseball game. I don't hear that at Cub games. I only hear it at football games. So there's things about the fans, although when you watch on TV, you don't really notice. You don't hear them say do stuff like that. But when you sit in the stands, you're dealing with dry, and then you add alcohol. They're talking about if they do allow fans in any of them, they're going to ban alcohol mm -hmm. so they can have some order. Right, and, then the, right. and then they're going to have people leave stadiums, uh, no matter what it is, in like one row at a time. You know what yeah, I mean? So like someone will organize a row and everyone sits there until that row is empty and people are out. But no, I'll watch all of it. What are you doing to keep your mind from just, uh, <laughs> you know, all? I think everybody's feeling a little. Well, what I'm you know, doing is I make sure to only watch things that are, are uh, I, at first, by the way, when this first started, and I thought it might be long, you know, whatever. I was so tired. All I did was sleep and I'd watch any shit or do anything. Now, everything that I do has a purpose to it. What I mean by that is if I'm watching a movie, I want to be, I want it to hit me. I want it to do um, something. I just watched this movie that just came out that Clark Duke made called Arkansas, and I loved it. I watched it streaming last night. It's one of those movies that didn't get to premiere in South by Southwest, and now it's streaming on iTunes, Netflix. I really, I mean, Netflix, uh, Amazon, I really loved it, and I got something about it. It gave me a feeling. It gave me a love for filmmaking. I'm learning 
I'm finally taking the time to play my guitars. And I mm. do guitar lessons over iChat. But the, I haven't taken any pictures. I've written some comedy, not a, not much, um, but enough to where, you know, but I'm not, I have to be, I've got kind of a writer's block. And one thing, I, everyone like, yeah, how do you cure writer's block? And what I've learned is it's the same thing with stage fright. Stage fright, you just got to keep on getting on stage. Writer's block, you just got to sit down to write. One day, you're not going to have it both stage fright and writer's block. I'm completely confident that whenever I have writer's block, I'll get it back, but who the fuck knows when? I can't control that. There's no there's no trick to it. I'm a comedian, man. That's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. And even I made a documentary, The Finding Vivian Mayer. You remember that? Yeah. And nominated for an Academy Award. I've never yeah. made another documentary. You know why? Mm. That's not what I do. Right. I... I mean, I'd like challenging myself and doing things and keeping things interesting, but my job is to be a comedian for people, for myself, out of self-respect. That's what I do, and I take it seriously, but that's my job. And being a comedian can mean being on Curb, seeing me at stand-up, seeing my special. I'm more proud of my special than anything, but, you know, with, with Netflix – They'll publicize it and show it. I mean, like have it be on the front page for like a week and then it's up to people to find it. So if 10 people who listen to you watch it, I'll be thrilled. Thrilled. Jeff, it's Jeff Garland, our man in Chicago. Yes. Right. And I'm, I captured lightning in a bottle because for me, you, I wanted to capture who I am, what I do, as well as. What's the point? You know, there's so many specials and a lot of them are so disappointing that it's kind of like become if a tree falls in a forest with specials. So I made something that really I'm so I'm happy. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you it's great. That's for other people to decide. But I can tell you it's the best that I can do. That's for sure. You know, I miss uh, seeing you and hanging out with you. I, I don't know when, Most when that's going gonna... <laughs> Well, by the way, odds are it'll be me coming to New York because once it, things loosen up and you can travel and all that, I don't mind traveling with a mask, um, yeah. but I'll come to New York for sure. That's just a special place to me. I love yeah. New York. Uh, what do you want to tell people about me? Something they may not know, something they may not uh, expect or, and I give you permission to just, you know, whatever. Okay. Well, if that's like you to do that. Um, well, you're, you're one of the most thoughtful, uh, kind people I know, and you don't suffer fools, which a lot of us don't. I don't either. It's very tough when people are foolish to suffer through whatever they're putting on you. But you're kind and you're thoughtful. But what I find fascinating is people who I meet, who when I talk about our friendship, where it comes up, who are, in fact, Republican, will tell me they don't like you, you stink, whatever they tell me. And I go, that's my friend, but OK, you're entitled to your opinion. I go, how many of his movies have you seen? They always say no, none. Always. I have never had someone tell me they don't like you who has seen your work ever. Now, that's mm -hmm. not about you. That's a fact. But mm -hmm. what I want to say is you're one of the great people that I know that sees things from the other side so clearly. So, as I said, thoughtfully, and you could have the most wonderful conversation with the majority of these people who think completely different than you. Mm. And you've been able to do that for years. I've seen you do it. And it's just remarkable watching you, you know, take away this attitude that they have. I'm not saying they're going to become your fan. I'm not going to say you're changed their minds, but they can have a common way to talk, you know, communicate with each other, not be so damn partisan. And I think that's the thing that People in general don't know about you, but especially those people, that they'd be surprised how much you understand their frustrations and their outlook politically. Well, that's nice of you to say. I do want to yeah. listen to them. I, I do want to hear. Of course you do. Well, whatever. you want to understand it. You, but I want to, common I do want to ground, understand. And we do have more in common. I don't, I don't mind talking to people that disagree with me or I disagree with them. Without fact, a doubt. I, and, and, and you know how it helps sometimes is that 
because I'm, I uh, will do that. And people will say, why are you, why are you spending even a minute with that person? I said, well, cause I need to understand what's going on. And then that person, me, then later will say, you know, I am sorry to say this, but uh, Trump is going to win and he's going to win Michigan and Wisconsin. Without a doubt. You knew that's why, by the way, I had no idea except for the fact that you said it, but that's because you listen to people. I know you people were so upset on, on on my side of the political fence. Without like, a doubt. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell us this and don't, and I'm well, like, I, well, I don't way, want to tell you this stuff. But, but the I, thing is you're listening to everyone and you're getting all the information you can as opposed to one source. You know, it's by the way, I think liberals are so guilty of having of of putting blinders on and truthfully, uh, you can't do that. You can't. You just can't. You got to let people have a different opinion than you. And I think when you calm these people on down and you talk to them and you embrace them, do you know what they think? Yeah, people can have different opinions. You're not going to change what their opinion is, no. but they're going to acknowledge that that maybe I should listen, uh, let other people speak. That's the growth that you can provide or anyone can provide when we do that. But to cut people off, you know, yeah. and I see it out here to the the political correctness of Hollywood is so it can be so nauseating. I mean, I'm a I'm a liberal and I hate Hollywood liberals for the most part because they're so they put up the blinders. They're so judgmental. They do everything that I don't like that the other side does. And I'm like, we're not getting anywhere. And anyone, by the way, isn't being liberal minded, being open minded. That's the and, idea. And, uh, that's yeah, what the word that, means. Well, that's the premise that I follow. So when I say I'm liberal, I'm open minded. By the way, in this podcast, yeah. I have revealed myself politically more so than I ever have in my in my life of I don't want to say public service, but in my life of being a comedian, I have never spoken this uh, this open and candidly. And it just you know, because I always do with you when we're talking alone. Sure. Yeah. But it, it, it brought it out of me. And and I, I'm sure there's some people who will be uh, upset with me saying about Hollywood liberals. But here's what I have to say. Just think about that Imagine video and know that I, like you, want to jump in and beat them up. Uh, <laughs> I don't like any of that stuff. That That whole, you know, I just feel like. Yeah, I mean, or even Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's not necessarily so liberal, but he doesn't like Trump. But sitting in a hot tub, smoking a cigar, Mm. telling me to stay in. What? Mm. What? Mm. No, 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 no. So a lot of Hollywood is tone deaf with that shit. By the way, there's a lot of great people here, a lot of thoughtful people in show business. So I don't want to say, you know, everybody... But there's plenty that make me sick and crazy that I can't stand. Are you going to regret as this comes to a close, like 10 minutes from now, uh, when when you're sitting there? Like, why did I why did why did I reveal so much? No, uh, no, no, no. I'll tell you why. Because it's you and your listeners and it's not me. Here's the thing. If I, it was my job to be really funny and I had to do a stand up set or I wrote a movie that had the under uh, tones of what you and I were just talking about. Yes, I would have regret because that's not my job. But the beautiful thing, it's why I don't really do talk shows anymore. When you have when you do a podcast, you can cover and you have time to explain and talk and give nuance. So I think that I have given some degree of nuance and it's with you. And I, and I have great respect for people who listen to your, your podcast. So I'm not worried about it at all. I'm not, if I lose a fan or two or someone's angry, nothing I can do. Sorry. I'm sorry. But well, I, I appreciate I use it. As my, if I yeah. use it as my comedy and I fail, then I really am sorry. And I have regret, but that's not what this was. Right. Right. Well, I think I'm 
um, projecting here on behalf of people <laughs> listening. I think that they are very happy to hear from you. You, well, you're are, very kind you, to say no, that. You are uh, a beloved soul uh, that all of us are feel, or at least feel like we're very familiar well, with. Well, Michael, I, I truly do the best I can. And yeah. um, well, that's evident. Yeah. And. Um, yeah. Um, I thank you for that. Thank you for. I thank you for everything. You're a hero. Uh, you know, you are. Remember when we did. No, you weren't there. But I did at the 92nd Street Y. You interviewed me. I'm not talking about that. So there was a night we were we were um, talking about. We were honoring Lenny Bruce. And mm. there were numerous comedians. I'm not going to say who. And, when, and they were saying, who's Lenny Bruce now? And I said. The only uh, uh, person that even comes close to being Lenny Bruce today is Michael Moore. Not as a stand-up, but with your artistry and what you do, you are a brave man and you're a hero to me. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and you're a beautiful young lady. <laughs> Thank you. I've aspired to that my entire yes, life. Yes, um, yes. Jeff, uh, I miss you. Um, I love you. I miss you too, pal. I and, love you too. And thank um, you for having me on your show. Yeah, your sons are all good. Everybody's okay. Everybody's great. Big ball okay. of delightful. Okay. All right. We will see each other again soon, hopefully. Yes, and, very um, soon. And yeah, thank you sooner for than later. Sharing enjoy your good this. looks. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> and right, thank you. Anyone who listened to this whole thing, my gosh, thank you. Thank you. And all right, thank talk you. to you later. Okay, Jeff. All right, take care. And, and I'm gonna you. leave this I'm gonna leave this going because I know that I shouldn't turn it off. Yeah, leave it going because just because it's downloading. It's down there, and I'm just gonna and I'm just gonna throw in a goodbye here uh, to the people listening. But leave okay. yours, leave yours up and going. I will. Okay. All right, I'll talk to you soon. All right, brother. Thank you. Bye. All right, bye bye. And uh, yes, and thank you, Jeff. Um, uh, it's been a great conversation. I hope everyone has enjoyed it. And uh, uh, Jeff seems hopeful that there will be another season of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Nothing official. Uh, but, uh, uh, any, any, anything hopeful right now will take. And, uh, that was great uh, to hear that and to share uh, this time, um, with um, a good friend of mine, everybody listening. I, you will hear from me soon. Um, thank you for tuning in to this episode and, uh, we'll be back, uh, next time with rumble. I'm Michael Moore and, uh, don't forget to wash your hands. Take care. 